I'm going to go real fast and the first let you know a little about, a bit about me so then what I tell you after about digital stuff makes sense. I started making films in 1963. Um, tomorrow, next January, is going to be my 50th anniversary of being a fool. And, uh, and, uh, I, when I started off, I'm, first off, I'm self-taught. I never went to school, uh, for which I can say thank God, because uh, schools basically teach you a lot of incorrect things, and which you then have to unlearn, or you get stuck in their box, and you only do movies, ink line numbers type filmmaking. Um, I started off in 16 millimeter, uh, in, as I say, 63, with silent black and white films, because that's what I could afford, which was, I had no money, so uh, usually before it meant somebody gave me some film stock of a laboratory or something like that, and printer stock, which is not meant to be shot on, but it's real cheap, it cost two cents a foot. <coughs> uh, so I made these films, and I graduated uh, after two years, uh, I ended up in prison for several years for refusing to serve in the military. Yay. And then, um, and then I caught up, and then I started making sound films. Uh, something about going to prison and sound was connected in my mind. Um, So I made films which at the time were what you would call them underground films and things like that, for which once there was a, a viable little subculture that kind of supported this. Um, I made short films for minus the two years of prison uh, for 10 years. And that's one thing I would advise people. You're all mostly older, so maybe it's uh, a little late to advise you this. But anyway, I find that today, in, in, in most people, they would just want to jump in and make a feature, first off. So they make a crappy feature, and then they get discouraged, and then they quit. Uh, and I really think it's important that one learn, learn your craft, and the way you learn is you make short films. Or maybe you make nothing, you just shoot. You just practice, practice making things before you have a, go make a film. Anyway, so I, sh I worked for 10 years making short films, and at some point I seem to have concluded that I was not going to make a living doing this. <laughs> and I, I never thought of making films as a career, but somehow I did have to eat or pay my rent. Although for those 10 years, I managed to avoid most of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I decided to make a kind of tour de force uh, feature film, which I did. It was called Speaking Directly. Um, a 110 minute long, 16 millimeter, very complex film, which I made while living in a one room cabin with a woman and her child with no running water, no electricity, and no money, of course, in uh, northern Montana, a place where we lived for five years. A very, very good experience. Garden, animals, slaughter animals, uh, things like that to survive. Uh, so this film sort of was about that, but it was really about America at the time, which was 1972-73, so the height of the Vietnam War. Watergate, really hot political time. So it was a film that wove my personal life in with my, my, my country's larger political life. Uh, it's in a number of archives and collections now. So it did what I, what I wanted it to do, which was make a big splash, because at that time nobody was making such films in America. We didn't make two hour long, complicated, intellectual, uh, underground films. <laughs> so it worked and got me vaulted into the festival world, for better or worse. And uh, I proceeded to continue to make 16 millimeter features, uh, largely, I can't say self-financed. Um, I learned how to work extremely poor. So in 1977, I made a film called Last Chance for a Slow Dance, uh, which is in this book, A Thousand Films You Must See Before You Die. So now, you heard it, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and is in, again, some collections, a $3,000 16 millimeter film, right? mm -hmm. um, which, which even at the time was impossible, except I figured out how to do it. Um, my actors even got $50. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I made these kinds of films, and this, for the most part, stayed very, very cheap. And a few times I had erstwhile producers, which always turned into a bad experience for me. I never have, have yet to have a good experience with someone who said they were a producer. 
uh, I mean, in some ways they were good. The first one I had, I had some doctors in La Jolla, California, um, put up $2,000 a piece in 1972. It wasn't very much for a doctor in way back then. So they had, and I, they had seen my script, it was sort of a Hollywood critique of Hollywood in the form of a detective thing. And I made the film, aerials, crane shots for $6,000. And, um, and they were pissed off because it wasn't a Hollywood movie. Right? Which was turned out good because they just dropped it like a hot potato and then it fell in my lap and then I sold it to British television someone later for $12,000. So we did make profit. <laughs> um, and I had a few other similar type experiences with people who wanted the glamour of movies and somehow thought they could buy in for you know, chump change. And uh, then they got the kind of film you could make, a very good film for, for, the, for the money that they were putting out, but they didn't realize that. Uh, anyway, so I went through all this. Uh, I uh, shifted to Super 16 in 1989, uh, I think it was. I made a film called Surefire in Super 16. And the next year I made a film in 35 millimeter, um, all the various in New York, which did show theatrically here in the States a bit, uh, sold in various European televisions. Um, and uh, that film, I do my own camera work, I do my own editing, I mean, I'm, a, I'm the best grip I know, I can put up things faster than anybody else because I know what I want and can talk instantly. Um, so with Vermeer, because if suddenly there was a budget, $240,000, 35 millimeter, people said, well, John, now you're a cameraman, right? What do I need a cameraman for? I mean, 35 millimeters, the film is bigger, but otherwise it's film. Oh, well, you're not gonna have lights now, John, no. You know, so they, they basically dumped the film industry shtick on me like now because I was a 35 millimeter mystically, everything had changed, and now I must do it by the book. And I said, no, I, I, I don't use lights. They just get in the way. Uh, I know there's a workshop coming up about how to do lights cheap. The cheapest lights is just use the light that's there, right? It's the cheapest in every way, money-wise, time-wise, time in the movie business if you're anywhere remotely industrial, time is money. And setting lights is a big waste of time if you just use your eye. So like the film, all the their mirrors, professionals who've looked at it, they assume it's scripted, it had no script whatsoever. They assume I had a crew of you know 10 people running around, 30 people running around setting lights and all this. The crew was me, focus, puller, and sound, of course. And it looks like a, a, a beautiful 35 millimeter high production value uh, film. The Metropolitan Museum in New York, top of the World Trade Center, Luscious lofts in Soho, all free, of course. <laughs> and uh, so, anyway, so I made those two films, and I made two more 35 millimeter films following that, where Panavision gave me their camera set up for free because uh, they had a little program supposedly to help graduating you know, students who sort of lure you into using their equipment. Uh, but I met a guy, Bob Harvey, who liked my work and let me use their best SEMO package for free twice. Um, for short periods, like one, two, 10 days, another time once a month. Um, and then I moved to Europe and made one last 35 millimeter film in 1995 in Italy. Um, and then I was asked to make something for a big arts exposition called Documenta, which is in Germany, in Karlsruhe, Germany. It happens every, once every five years. And it's sort of like the biggest splash in the arts business, supposedly. And they dangled, they said, oh, John, we'd like you to make a film for a million dollars. Excuse me, a million dollars? To make whatever I want? I should have been suspicious, but I wasn't, so. So I fell for it. And then they said, oh, by the way, you can shoot in 35, do whatever you want. But Sony has this new thing called digital video. And they'd like some artists to play around with it. So I looked at the literature they sent me, and I said, hmm, you got one camera with a single chip that does this, that, and the other. You got another camera with three chips that does this, that, and the other. Sounds like they're different. You make different imagery. Can you send them both to me? So they did, and a uh, deck and a couple of monitors. And I was up in Scotland uh, researching the, the film I wanted to make for a million dollars and arrived this package with all this stuff. And, uh, pulled out the DV camera and played with it for 30 seconds and instantly told myself I am never making another celluloid film. Because I like the imagery. I immediately ran through a test because this was digital and it was new and, and uh, uh, you know, didn't quite believe what they said. So they said, well, if you uh, 
digital is digital, and make a copy of digital, the copy is just like the original. So I filmed something, made a copy, made, I went 10 generations away. And the 10th generation is exactly like the original. So I said, yes, you're correct. So I thought, this is great. So I began to work in digital video. And uh, it radically changed how I work, how I think about my work, and that's the kind of thing I like to address here. Um, and so that was 1996. At that point, I've made 14 feature length, you know, an hour or more length films, about up to two hours long. Um, in celluloid, I averaged about a feature every year and a half, um, which I don't really understand how I did it because I'm always broke. <laughs> and I hate hustling money, and I don't hustle money. I find some way to, you know, get just enough to do something. Um, so the attraction for me of digital video was first that as soon as I looked at it, I thought, this is really wonderful. Plus, I was getting kind of sick and tired of film, uh, and, and the limitations of film, because there's, there's things you can do in film that cost an arm and leg, optical printing, and things, and there are things that you can do in a video camera that, that you know, you do it in the video camera and it costs nothing, and if you were to make it the, the equivalent thing in film, it would cost you $50,000. So it's very nice to, hmm, this medium lets me do all these things that aren't like normal film, and it costs nothing but my time and effort in learning how to do it. So that was a big attraction. The other major attraction was suddenly I thought, I never have to talk to people about money again. Yeah. All the people who I talked with money about, their interest was money. My interest was art. Yeah. So it was, you were always a loggerhead. It's like, no, I don't make films to make money. That's not what my business is. My business is to make something that's aesthetically interesting to me. And if it happens to be interesting to other people, that's wonderful. But if it doesn't, it's OK. And, uh, you know, business people, people with money, that's not their interest. They may say they're interested in art, but when the nitty comes to gritty, they want their three, three story, you know, their three point story and their commercial and, and their famous actor and all the rest of the rigmarole that quickly, <coughs> you have to make a more or less conventional film, which frankly, I have no interest in whatsoever. I never go to them. You know, when, like, when I'm in a film like this and other filmmakers come and I look at what their films are, usually I say, well, I, you know, I don't have much life left and I'm not going to waste an hour of time. I'm looking at something that I'm not interested in. If you have something that stretches the parameters of my life by showing me a scene of my views like I've never seen it before or something like that, then I'm interested. But if it's just another story told the usual way, then I frankly do not have time for it. So I pass on how to move it. So, um, so the digital video, it's had two attractions. One, it was aesthetically, technically much more elastic, much more things you could do with it. And secondly, that it cost, it, it drove the production costs down to, if you can get your hands on a camera or you have a camera, after that, it's virtually free. Now, when I started, the camera cost 2,000 bucks and a computer that could do a crude uh, editing program back then, I used Premiere 5.1 crashed every 15 minutes, but it still be working on flatbed. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I think a computer I got was like $5,000. Now, you know, a $600 laptop will run Premier's, like Premier CS5, a very sophisticated editing program. So all those prices have been driven down. You go get a consumer camera for three, $500 and you're in business, right? You know, these days with HD, you're in business re uh, more or less on a footing to compete with Hollywood minus the stars because technically you can make something that looks as gorgeous as a 35 millimeter thing done by pros. Uh, so those were the two things that propelled me. It was a more interesting medium and it, it eliminated the question of money basically or shrank it to such proportions that even I could deal with it. So, uh, so I shifted. And one thing I had to do, I've been making films for 35 years at that point, and they were very, you know, poverty films. Um, so, so I had this, this ingrained habit of a fear of touching the button, because every time you heard the camera, that meant dollars were flying by. Yeah, so right. you, you wanted to make sure that, you're, you're, that, that touching the button produced something. And I did get where, uh, so uh, one of my, well, the film I mentioned, Last Chance for a Slow Dance, uh, this one uh, that's in the, the book, um, 
which is a crude but very good film, extremely powerful, makes everybody feel like shit at the end. That's <laughs> loosely what I'm trying to do. <laughs> um, and uh, it had, it's 90 minutes long and I shot 95 minutes of film. So it was a virtual one-to-one -one shooting ratio. I did one other film like that. Uh, in 35 millimeter, I shot a film called Frame Up, which, uh, which, I, which was essentially one-to-one. I, I think maybe I didn't use a few minutes out of 90 minutes. Uh, and that was in 35 millimeter. The crew was me and a young woman who had done 16 millimeter camera assistant work. And we shot a whole very beautiful, uh, complicated, there had a lot of technically complicated things that you could do with this camera. Uh, and that was a one to one shooting ratio for the absolute rock bottom price you could you would pay, $40,000 it cost. And, uh, how do I get off on that? <laughs> um, so, okay, so, uh, so I had this fear of touching the button. So that's, you know, so my one-to-one -one shooting ratio on some had to do with this, make sure it's going to be uh, good. Although, contrary to what many people would think, my first fiction feature, which was completely scripted, called Angel City, I scripted because I thought at the time that that was the best way to kind of control things and keep the costs down. Uh, last Chance for a Slow Dance would cost half as much as, the, as Angel City. Uh, had one scripted <coughs> scene, and the rest was improvised. And I went, hmm, I guess I must be wrong about this keeping price down by, by controlling, by having a tight script. And since then, uh, I have most of the time improvised, some kind of times completely wildly, beginning with no script whatsoever, uh, certainly an idea but no script, no written things for actors to say. And basically, I, I learned in the process how to write through actors, which is much more fun than for me and for, the, for actors who can improvise. Some can't do it, some are not very smart. And so if you ask them to actually think, they're in trouble. No <laughs> uh, script. No script. Yeah, right. Some people want their lines fed to them, and so you can't, I can't deal with those people. Um, so. So I got digital video, and I, I had these backlog of 35 years of filmmaking habits, amongst them the fear of touching the button for fear of spending money. And it was very deeply imprinted in me, so I went, well, John, this camera isn't like that. And you must, you must change your habit. So I told myself for the first year I've had it, I made myself go out and shoot every day walk around and shoot, and not, shoot, not shoot for this movie or that movie, just go around and shoot. Part of it was to learn how this camera worked, you know, because the, technically they're different, and aesthetically they're different than film cameras, and, and I wanted to experiment to find out what's, what you can do with this camera. The earlier cameras had all kinds of digital effects, which I regret are no longer available on most consumer cameras, or even for professional cameras never have because they consider that silly. Um, which is regretful for me. Um, so I walked around for uh, a few years, constantly, with a camera in my hand, going out and shooting every day. Uh, for maybe go out for an hour, maybe go out for five hours, just walking around, looking, shooting. And uh, I assume you're all here because you want to make things in digital video. Uh, and so my first advice for you is if you have a camera, it doesn't matter if it's your cell phone or whatever kind of camera you have these days, go around every day and shoot. And because if you don't, you will not learn what this instrument can do. So it's kind of like being a musician. When I, when I made films in celluloid, um, you know, I, sh I made a movie every year and a half, and uh, the movie would usually take somewhere from five days to maybe a month. So every five, so five days to a month of every year and a half, I was playing my instrument. Now, if you were a musician and you did that, you'd be the shittiest musician in the world, because you can't be a good musician by playing once, you know, once a year for a week or two. You have to play every day, and the same as you're a painter, and the same if you're a writer. You have to do it every day, and in, in this media, you know, in film, it was sort of understandable because it costs a lot of money to walk around and shoot film. But suddenly, that's not there. Right? Suddenly, it doesn't cost you anything but your passion, your time, your energy, and virtually no money. So you only have yourself to blame if you don't walk out and go shoot every day. 
So that's a big thing that I would say, the digital shift, it changes so you can be like a painter or something like that, where you can say, I'm gonna go do this and it's almost not costing me anything but my time and energy. And then you learn how to do things. And it's the only way you learn how to do things. You know, you're reading about it, taking courses about it, none of that teaches you what you can teach yourself by going out and actually doing it. So that's the most important thing for me about the digital video, is it says, now you can do it. It'll, 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 it ends up being a kind of litmus test for, do you really want to do it, right? Because if you don't really want to do it, you probably won't do it. So you'll have a reason why your camera sits in the closet, and you say, oh, I have this film I want to make, but somehow it never gets made, because, because you never bothered first to learn, learn the tools of your trade. And the only way you learn is by going out, you know, playing guitar every day, or painting every day, or in this case, going out with your digital camera, whatever kind of camera it is, and finding out what it can really do and what you can do with it. So that's the most basic lesson I can pass on to you. If you got a camera and you want to do this, start using your camera. Right? Don't. And most people get locked up and say, you know, I want to make a film, and many people say, I want to make a film, but I have to have an idea, and then it stops right there because they don't have an idea. So when I went, when, when I started with a digital video, I just walked around and shot. Now I think I made, uh, what did I count? Uh, what's 14 plus 32? Is, uh, 14 from 32 is what? 16, 17, 18, 18. So now I made 18 long pieces, lots of shorts, so I don't even think about it. Um, 18 long pieces in digital video, of which at least, I have to go through the list and look, at least of which six or seven of them, I didn't intend to make those films. I didn't think about making this film. I really, yesterday I showed a film, uh, a kind of portrait of the area of Lisbon that I lived in for a year and a half, and I didn't mean to make that film. I just walked around my neighborhood and was taking shots, and many, you know, this in this case, I shot in 1996, 97, and, uh, and I just walked around, and last year I decided I should look at this footage and see, see I knew there was a film hiding in it, you know, somewhere, and uh, in fact, I think there's three films hiding in there, so I made one. If I had an infinite life, I'd probably make the other two, but I think I'll pass on that. And um, so, people think, I have to have an idea for a film, and that blocks them right there. Or they have an idea and it's a shitty idea, and they have a shitty idea. Now I have to wait around and think of a better idea. Meanwhile, they're not going out shooting. Right? And my view is, just go out and shoot. Don't think about what, you're, what you need to shoot for. Don't have an idea for a film. Just go practice shooting. And probably what will happen to you is what happened to me. By just going out and shooting, films just happen all by themselves. You know, sort of effortlessly, aside from walking around, shooting things, learning how to use your camera, and then after a while, oh, I got 30 hours of material, and there's a feature you know, that you didn't even think about making. So I made like, I think, six of those, wow. you know, that, that I quite honestly say, I never started out to make this film. I never thought, I'm making a film about a portrait of Place X. I just happened to live in Place X and walked around and shot. And, uh, and, and so I, I know consciously I did not think, oh, I'm making a portrait of this place or that place. I just was going around basically having fun, because shooting for me is fun. And uh, it's fun and it's informative. It teaches me how to use my instrument. And uh, the, the, the feedback loop is actually quite fun. You say, yeah, I made, I made something beautiful, that's nice. But I did it without any thought that, oh, you know, a year or five years, or in this case, 16 years later, I would go, hmm, let's sit down and go through this and edit. Oh, uh, I mean, all the, the only thing that I edit, I did edit it, and it has a, a, a handful of hopefully invisible dissolves. Oh, yeah. So I was doing a workshop in Tokyo, and I sent my students out to shoot for the afternoon, and I was taking a walk in the neighborhood, and I came across this park, and I went up those stairs, and there was the, it was the lawn with these foliage around. I thought, oh, I guess I should do something too, so for the students' sake. And so I went back and, <coughs> down and walked up the stairs. But I'd been through it, so I knew there was this gate when you entered, so the camera lifts up there. And then uh, it took less, uh, let's say, somewhere around 40 minutes to shoot the whole thing. And, uh, and then it took about an hour and a half to edit it, if that. Um, so this was like three hours of work to me which to me was three hours of play. It was just fun to do. Yeah. Yeah. Was the uh, flute 
something you added? Or the was flute I added out. Oh, right. The rest of it was just the ambient sound of the tapes. Because I like that the beginning where you had the, the walkie, the, yeah. and the yeah. birds going, and that's what it's. I think it's very beautiful uh, visually, but I think you can do a lot of sound on that. And I think, I think, I think that the picture could be brought out, uh, and the, the experience could be much more enhanced. Mm -hmm could be enhanced with sound. And what I would say is, I would give this to Philip Glass and him compose it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm serious. I, I don't like Philip Glass. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think, well, to me, I, I make lots of shorts, and to me, they're just a sketchbook, and they're really worth three hours of my time, and then I don't care about them. Yeah, but they I seldom show them, except for this context. I never send them to a festival, so it's just, I mean, for me, it's just play. So I don't really, I don't know. I take it seriously in the sense I take a sketchbook seriously. It's just something, something to file away in the afternoon. But uh, uh, I like it the way it is. I like this the simple ambient sound that's quite rich enough for me to kind of think that you're in this big, bustling city and you're hearing birds and all yeah. that stuff. And then a jet does go by. You know, so you do hear a jet. <laughs> one but, uh, was this the solarization effect you're talking about? And this was in camera solarizing and in camera. Um, this, uh, whatever they call it. Stutter? Call, call uh, it uh, it's done with this camera. I've, I've seen it called polarizing, too. No, oh, no. no, it's solarizing. It's solarizing. It's solarizing. It's solarizing. In, in the computers, they often call it posterization. Or it's, it's, it's solarizing. It's saturated. Anyway, this is the camera. The VX2000. It's a VX2000. Yeah. You can dial how many frames, you, you know, whether you yeah, want three yeah. or four or yeah. whatever. You can dial one. Two for one, you can go up to, I don't know, a second or so. Yeah. And shooting that, just to, just to understand how these kind of instruments work. You know, this, my earlier cameras didn't have the flip out screens, but I, even when I made films, I was very used to shooting without looking through the viewfinder because of the shots you would get. So like when I was shooting the foliage, I was just going, I'm just dancing with the foliage. I did look, you know, I did look and set this, the shutter, the thing, the speed of, you know, how many frames, I thought worked best for this movement. Yeah. You know, I was, I, I, but it wasn't really. I wasn't looking at the screen. <coughs> I could have, but that would have frozen my motions. So this is just learning how to dance and think about. Oh, what motion motion will work for these things? Are you changing, changing the effects as you were doing. In no, the camera? no. I, I would set the uh, the solarizing is highly sensitive to your exposure level. Like it looks com graphically completely different if it's underexposed or it's overexposed. It completely goes all over the map and has very rich things, which you can see in some of the shots when it comes to something bright, it, it looks quite different than when it goes into something dark. And the all the editing <coughs> was I was doing is it's like music. It's it's dark, it's light, it's close, it's small. Keep variation going. So if I just take it straight out of the camera, that I wouldn't have had that. Control and the editing was just like, well, I just had some things with big leaves and now let's go to little textural things, and which is all art is. It's just juggling these very basic loud, soft, bright, dark. You know, that's all any art is, is controlling contrasts. And that's, you know, so you have to learn to. I, I usually when somebody asks, well, what did you think when you did that? I say, well, I didn't think at all. <laughs> and I just looked at it, and I'm sort of here. We are in Kansas City, a place of jazz. I regard myself as a jazz musician. And you say, okay, what's the theme? The theme is this little park in Maceda. Yeah. You know, so yeah. instead of a song theme, right? And then now I go noodle around because I know my, my instrument and my craft so well, I, I, I don't have to think about it. And in fact, if you did think about it, it would destroy it. You can't, a, 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 good, a good musician can't think while they're playing. They're playing, right? They've, they've gotten way past the think process. Now they just, it's them, right? And it's the same with this. As soon as you start thinking, you start fucking up, right? <laughs> right? So I, you know, so as I said, I, this was just a sketch for me. It was just like, and it literally took three hours of my time. I like to show, I, I happen to like it, but, yeah. but uh, you know, it's just a quickie little thing where I learned something in process. You know, and that's why I do these things, just because it's a little experiment for me to <coughs> learn, well, does this all work? So, uh, anyway, does anybody have that? Yeah, that in, in improvisation, I mean, you're, you're improvising, basically, what jazz musicians typically do. I mean, you, 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 play, you play within a, a structure. It's like, okay, well, I'll meet you eight bars later at A, and then, but you yeah. can do everything in between. Right. 
and it seems like your style. Don has a has a film kind of like that too, uh, the storm. And and the sound really drives it. So I, I I get where he's coming from too. And I, I it's exactly what I was thinking of like God, we can hear footsteps, we can hear a little more music, we can hear the, the leaves brushing, more birds trip. And those are elements, those are color, those are little things that yeah. you can just sprinkle in and do it at your will and that's part of the art form. And, yeah. and uh, yeah. Well, I, I agree. Uh, as I said, I did nothing to sound except drop the flute in. And you were saying earlier. Otherwise, it's just the sound of the actual shot. Yeah. Which yeah. I, I tend to, I, I personally like ambient sound a lot. Yeah. And I, and I like sound. to, in effect, compose with it after a fashion. Mm -hmm. But I'm very conscious that I have the ambient sound. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm kind of encouraged now because I'm getting into film after years of doing a lot of other stuff. But my first brush with visual arts was as a news photographer. Okay, you go out, you do not think, you absorb. And I never, you never know when you walk out the door every day how many stories you're going to come back with. You know, the, you know the least you're looking for, but you may come back with <coughs> stills or footage and pull five or six stories out of it. So, Basically, what you're telling me is I really don't have to change a thing about that. <laughs> the only thing you have to On change. The, the, uh, the only thing you have to change is I, I do stills also, and stills and moving is two totally oh, different yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm terrible at te I, I, in, 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 in with moving stuff. I'm very good at getting people, and I cannot take a still shot of people for the life of me. <laughs> After 68 years, I said, why huh. the fuck can't I take yeah. still shots of people, I, 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 right? I, 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 and then you can put a movie, a video camera in my hand, and it's just like, you know, you like the, the easiest That's thing. Why, yeah. It's because I don't like lights. Yeah. Uh, I love lights. It's called the sun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so that film, I was sitting in Rome. is a beautiful place. I lived there five years. And uh, I was sitting at my head thing. On a beautiful day, and I said, "John, get the fuck out of your computer and go out for a walk, <laughs> damn it!" Right? So, uh, so I just usually I, I didn't go out to shoot, I did, but I usually carried my camera with me all the time. So I, I went out and I was on Piazza Navona and I saw this this uh, wedding entourage. They had two videographers <coughs> and three photographers, and and I, first that caught my eye because it was a little bit. You know, they do that usually they'll have one videographer. And, so this was obviously people with some money or something. So initially that caught my eye and I was amused by it. And then I locked, saw the light on her dress and I thought it was just beautiful. So I, I was mainly interested in the light on her dress. And <laughs> I, I walked with them from uh, Piazza Navona to where you would cross a major street to get to Campo di Fiori. And, uh, and I was shooting, or I thought I was, so I got to there where the intersection was. I noticed I'd gotten out of phase and I turned the camera off instead of on. So I'm like, <laughs> and then I and then I started again where where at the beginning he gives her the flowers which was totally I, I was just and you were talking about you going out to shoot well when I when I'm shooting I'm just there right like I didn't hear him I understand Italian enough to know that he was bitching at me but, yeah, but yeah, I didn't yeah, hear yeah. him when I was doing it because I was doing what I was doing and like I was about this far away from him I was just like <laughs> you know, a little white-haired man glued to my side all the way. And uh, uh, when I'm shooting, I just, you know, the rest of the world becomes invisible. And part of, the, part of it is a trick. If you, any of you have dogs? You know, if you ever had a dog, you know, if you act afraid in front of a dog, they instantly get it and they come get you. And, they turn <coughs> and then they run away, right? Well, the same thing with the camera. If you act with authority with the camera, people never give you problems. As soon as you show any tentativeness, should I be doing this? Am I allowed to do this? As soon as you do that, then of course you're not allowed to do it. People will get on your back. And I'm certain you have the same problem, you have the same experience doing photography. If you go in to do it and you're focused on that, somehow it puts an aura of this is okay. Right? And as soon as you show any sign that you have a question whether it's okay, people instantly read on it and, and they'll say it's not okay. So um, anyway, with this film, uh, so I didn't, I had turned the camera off, so luckily when I started again, he gave her the flowers. So as I was going along, I was thinking, well, this is a very nice shot. And only at the end, when the woman came out, saying, hey, take the photos, and he turns around and sort of snarls, like, they're taking the photos, because he was pissed at me, I guess. And, uh, 
And as soon as that happened, I realized I didn't have a shot, I had a film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that last thing, you know, if she, the woman hadn't materialized, I wouldn't have had a film. I wouldn't, wouldn't have had the something that turns, turns the shot into a film. And the thing is that you can only get that if you jump in and do it. You know, I, I, I didn't start off to make the film. Accidentally, I made a film because something came in that I could not have predicted. So, and uh, like the film I showed yesterday was a very long piece about uh, a portrait of a part of Lisbon. It was where I kind of began to learn this thing, with, with the other liberating thing of digital video, is something doesn't have to be happening. You know, like, in the film, it's like, well, nothing's happening. I've got to get off the button because it costs me money and I can't afford to shoot nothing happening. And if you wait long enough, oftentimes things will start to happen or things that you don't really see when, it's, when you're shooting are happening off screen and the, uh, the, the sound off screen turns the image into a completely other story than what you're actually looking at. And that was part of the learning process of really, no, this is a different kind of thing. It's not like film, and I can take the risk and go there, and in this case, take the risk of having this guy punch me out, or, uh, <laughs> or, or, or whatever, and eating up some tape, and then mystically at the end, this woman materializes in, in terms of what, what would have been a, a, a shot I might have used somewhere else of the light on the dress, which was my primary interest. And then magically it turned into a film, just by what happened by persisting and following through. Right? and not worrying about, well, you know, like, at the beginning it gets a, the, the long part of just walking you know, for a while gets maybe a little, I wouldn't call it boring, but, but you know, you're, you're kind of something, and then something happens. You're kind of, you know, built anxiety. It's like you're going along, you're saying, you know, and then all of a sudden when something happens, as little as it is, the camera rises, you get to see her face. And this other thing is like, okay, had I shot that normal shutter speed, it wouldn't be interesting. It was a choice to say, I want to shoot this at slow shutter speed and get this flowing thing, because mainly I was interested in the dress and the light, and that, but that showed the, played with that the best. But then for the rest of it, it turned out to be a very good aesthetic choice to, to do this. You have this wonderful painterly quality that's going through. And again, that was a decision you had to make then on the spot, to say, this is the best way to shoot this. Not, I'll go dick around with it later on the computer. If I'd shot that for the normal, you know, I work in PALS at 20, 25th or 50th of a second shutter speed. It just would have been a mundane shot, right? A nice mundane shot, but it wouldn't have made, it wouldn't have sounded like this little thing ends up doing. Any other thoughts, questions? I think we're going to stop here in a few minutes. The one thing was <coughs> back in my news days, I was in a position where I was shooting both stills and footage, so. You know, I mean, I come in in the morning, I set the elbow and the Nikon on my desk, do my paperwork, take the elbow and the Nikon off my desk, they're loaded, ready to go, go out the door. So I didn't, never got button fear, because I knew I'm going to be shooting that camera, um, which is one thing that even on a bad day, I never walk out the front door without a camera, yeah. even if I feel like crap, yeah. because some, sure as anything, Something won't happen. Come along. Yeah, be ready. So you should take his advice. You can do this bit. Carry your camera. Yeah. And very much, you know, what this one kind of brings you in that moment throughout. It's like you're kind of there. You know, it's a, kind of a Zen thing, though, most in a way. And uh, it was kind of interesting because I was watching it, and it reminded me of it used to be some independent television stations would, at a certain time, they have a little bit of filler so to speak, after a short film yeah. between a feature and something else. And, and you don't see that anymore. So it was kind of neat. It was like, oh, yeah, it brought me back to that. Well, they're going to fill that time up with advertising now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to lose a second on that. Yeah. And this is just pure curiosity question. Why do you do PAL? Why do you like PAL? Uh, I shot on PAL originally because uh, I was living in Europe. That was the most compelling reason. And I got the cameras in Europe. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it does give you another 100 lines of resolution horizontally. Um, and so it is a somewhat more tight image. And, uh, I, and I was still suffering uh, analog hangover where NTSC just had horrible bleeding and reds and stuff like that, which PAL did not. And I had had a Hi8 camera before, and I used PAL Hi8 because 
because in analog, PAL has a better color system. And uh, I can't say I can see it in digital. I don't think it, 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 it doesn't apply. That, that concern doesn't, you know, when they ship it to digital, that some, something changed. And so it's not a problem that way. But you do get the other 100 lines of vertical resolution. Uh, but I suppose the real compelling ones, I was in Europe, and that's what the cameras that were available were given to me. What are you using now? Uh, I'm, I just got that camera, the NX7, and I have an XD cam, uh, X1, uh, which my university bought for me. I gave a grant, somebody said, quick. <laughs> 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 so I have this, uh, a good camera, and uh, I may get the companion piece to this, which they make a camcorder uh, called the Next DG something or other, and it takes, that has interchangeable lenses, and it takes the same lenses. These still cameras do not shoot motion the same way. If you move them laterally, that everything oh, bends yeah. because they're scanning uh, or vertically instead of horizontally. And so it becomes a little problematic <coughs> to use those for some things. Rolling shutter. Huh? Rolling shutter. Right. Yeah. So, so, uh, so whereas if I get the video camera, that's very, that it's a very small camcorder, but uses the same lenses, so I can change the lenses, use the same lenses for both cameras. I don't know what time we're up. I think they're going to throw us out because they're using this room for something else, I think. Five minutes left. Okay, so we have five minutes. So anything else along this line I can <coughs> address for you? In, in, the, in This afternoon I'll deal more with uh, dealing with actors and more practical hands-on type stuff and less, less. Uh, but to me, like the digital has changed everything. Like, it really changed the whole attitude about what, do, what is one doing? I, you, know, you say, I'm making a film because it sort of presumes, okay, I have a preset idea and then I'm gonna go carry it out. Mm -hmm. The digital thing, which, which I find most liberating, is that it just it takes that off of you. You say, right. I'm just shooting, right? And as you shoot, things happen. You learn and then probably film happens, right? Would there ever be a time shooting on film would be an advantage for a certain effect or a certain look or not? Well, if you want it to look like film, then you should shoot on film. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm tired of that. And I, I, you know, it's sort of like, you know, if you make oil paints, don't try to make an oil painting look like a watercolor, or vice versa, right? They're two different mediums. And it's true that the digital video can look pretty much like an ordinary movie, although if you're someone like me, I can tell in one second because I'm going to say, that's video because there's no gate weave, there's no dust, dirt, and scratches. Right? And, which is innate to film. Film is dirty. It's a, it's a primitive, dirty medium. Which sometimes is very nice. Right? And uh, I would try to, you know, the, the, w when, when digital video first came out, there was this rather tortured, ridiculous thing of people, people trying to get the film look out of digital video. Mm -hmm. Well, first off, the look they were looking for had nothing whatsoever to do with film. Right? They said the film look, and, and I said, excuse me, what you want to emulate is 35 millimeter optics. They wanted less depth of field. Mm -hmm. And nothing to do with being on film or on video. They had to do with the size of the imaging, of, of the, what you're shooting on too, so 35 millimeter negative about that big, and the optics of the lens that serves that. That's all it had to do with, nothing to do with film per se. It had only to do with optics. Mm -hmm. Now that this camera basically has a, 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 an imaging thing just about the size of 35 millimeter film, and it has the same optics. Yeah, which camera? Camera. This is the next set. It has. It isn't quite as big as the uh, film. You know, 35 millimeter in a still camera is, is basically twice as big as it in a movie camera because you're looking at it vertically. So it's really the width of, of, of you know, the still cameras. Negative is about that big, and the movie camera is about that big, right? So it's the optics. And so what they were thinking is, I want my film to look, I want my video to look like uh, a Hollywood movie that has not a lot of depth of field. But I want the, as normal early digital video cameras are imaging to something that are basically like eight millimeter film, which are inherently almost completely wide angle. And you have to go telephone to start throwing things out of focus if you want to throw them out of focus. And that's what they were talking about. But it had nothing to do with film, which I get irritated, but I said, well, 
uh, it occupied the digital video magazines for a year or two years where people made these complicated devices so they could put a 35 millimeter film or can't lens onto these things. They would build these things to and say, well, why don't you just accept? It is what it is. Use it for its virtues. <coughs> Later on, when they, they came out like this, then if you wanted to have that look, then it's natural to the instrument. So for, to answer your question, you know, if you want to make something really look like film, then you should really shoot in film and be prepared to pay for it. If you were shooting like a historical thing from like centuries ago, would, can digital, can you do things with digital to make it well, there's, have that th there, of there's plenty of programs, and these days, uh, you know, on your cell phone, you can have an app that will instantly archaicize your snapshot. <laughs> you know, it'll turn it sepia, you know, put junk, you know, chemical stains, whatever you want on it, right? Uh, so there are there are programs inside most editing things that if you want scratch and dirt on it, it'll it'll put it. I personally hate that, right? And so why, you know, if you're shooting in video, let it be video, right? If you want that, shoot in film and let it do that. Right? But if you're talking about something where you have a, you know, you're doing a historical thing and you want to, but then I would say, well, why don't you go get some old footage or old stills and just shoot them clean on your video and <coughs> let the original speak for itself, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than trying to fake the original by, usually when you fake, it looks like you faked. So that's why I, I, I frankly, I'm unable to look at a Hollywood movie because I look at the lighting and I say, this lighting has nothing to do with the lighting that would be in that room. Mm -hmm. And it never does. You know, you are like when you see a, a, a car scene in, any, in any, almost any movie, how many people drive with a, a bright light underneath their, <laughs> underneath their dashboard blinding them to seeing what they're driving? <laughs> Nobody drives like that because that isn't the way lights are in a car, right? And that's the way nearly all car scenes are lit. And, so, well, and I have no problem with the artifice. Well, my problem is with when through complete artifice you try to emulate what you, you purport to present as reality, right? And this is, if you want to make a Brachian thing, make a Brachian thing. Give me pure artifice, that's fine. I don't mind going to a Kabuki play, right? But, and I wouldn't mind going to a Kabuki movie. I mean, not, you know, a movie that was as artificial and contrived as, as a Kabuki thing. But when you try to say, I want my cake and eat it too, and say, ah, this is realism, except nothing about it is real. That, 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 <coughs> and usually, that falsity reflects itself all the way through the entire play, including what it's saying, right? And then I say, oh, I don't have time for that anymore. So I think they're tossing us out of here. Do a pleasant stopping point, whatever works for you.